We are in Isaiah, the second session, and uh, it's about the judgment of God's chosen. It's going to focus on Judah and uh, Israel and Jerusalem, but we will discover as we get into Isaiah, much of what he has to say is relevant to us today, and that may come as a surprise. And uh, so we uh, really, the book of Isaiah that what we're undertaking is one of the most exciting books in the Bible. It may seem very formidable at first, but it's probably, it's clearly the highest, uh, uh, he's the, considered the greatest of the writing prophets. He ministered during the reign of four kings, which included the invasion of the northern kingdom by Assyria, which is a big overhang on the history that's going on here. And we'll also get into Hezekiah, and we also have reason to understand the planet Earth changed during in 701 BC. And we'll talk about that too when we get there. So it's going to be a very diversified study. And I think it should be a lot of fun. But let's understand that Isaiah is the most comprehensive of all the prophets. His themes span not only the creation of the universe, but also the creation of a new heavens and a new earth after all this. And he really focuses on that. Most of what we know about the millennium doesn't come from Revelation 20. It comes from Isaiah 65 and 66. And there's no other prophet that matches his majestic eloquence on the glory of God. His vocabulary is larger than all the, uh, the Psalms all put together. Uh, it's l larger than any of the other prophets. All the nations of the world are included in his predictions. That may come as a surprise. No other prophet is more focused on the redemptive work of the Messiah or is more clearly f aware of grace. We always think of that as a New Testament idea and that, that's a naivete on our part. So let's talk a little bit about the text we're going to deal with. We're going to, we'll, we'll stay with the King James as our baseline because we're all familiar with that, but we're also going to draw on the International Standard Version Bible, which is in the process of being released as we speak. And the reason we are is because it uniquely uses the Dead Sea Scrolls as its primary text. The Great Seal, uh, as they call it, the, uh, of Isaiah, uh, is uh, we have a proprietary translation by Dr. Peter Flint himself uh, and Dr. Welty, who was one of the, the uh, key personages behind the International Standard Version, the ISV. The ISV uses the Dead Sea Scrolls as the primary text, and it uses the Masoretic, the Septuagint, and these other texts as variants in their footnotes and so forth. And uh, we will also have the benefit of exegetical comments, both by Dr. Uh, Flint and Dr. Welty. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls are typically abbreviated DSS, for, and as they were found in uh, Qumran Cave 1. And uh, the Great Scroll, of course, as I say, is, is a, a complete uh, copy of the book of Isaiah, which gives us a thousand year advantage over the Masoretes, which were 900 AD. So this is a huge, huge uh, insight. M much will come out ultimately through, as our study here that you won't find in most commentaries. And um, this proprietary translation is the property of uh, the, uh, uh, I, the ISV. Uh, we sponsored that so we could have access to it. And the Septuagint and the Masoretic texts are used as variants uh, also. We, we're not putting them away, They're there, but we're treating the Dead Sea Scrolls as the primary one, which is unique. And, uh, but something else I want you to be aware of as we get into this, and that is there's a broader, more modern relevance to Isaiah than most people realize. And I want you to be sensitive of that and watch it yourself. See, God had called a special people to represent him, and they had become apostate and failed. And that's true of Israel, and it's also true of the church. And we have materials that really amplify that. We have that perspective of the Old Testament from Stephen's, from Acts chapter 7, where Stephen summarizes all that. And we also see the same profile of the church as Jesus himself profiles in the, in the epistle that he wrote, which is the, the last, last of seven in uh, Revelation 2 and 3. So, so this many, m much of what we see will be couched in historical terms. But we want to be uh, sensitive to, they may be applying to today more so than we normally would realize. And uh, the enemies of God are represented in, in, uh, in the period we're going to be looking at, both by Assyria against the northern kingdom, against Babylon against the southern kingdom. But they become metaphors of the enemies of God in a way that's going to be very prominent in the end times. We'll talk about that as we go too. But we're going to see God's judgments and his ultimate restoration. 
uh, depicted, and it's going to be surprisingly relevant to God's people today. And so with that, let's take a quick glimpse of how the uh, prophecy of Isaiah is organized. And so we're going to see it, we're partitioning it into three divisions. The first division are the first 35 chapters. And we'll have Judah and a glimpse of the throne of God. That comes up in our next session, by the way. Uh, and of course, then it's Israel. And then he's also going to deal with all the nations, eight key nations. And we'll go through that. He's going to deal with the world, the day of Yorivavhe, the day of the Lord, as we usually translate it. And the, in fact, that little section from uh, of ver, uh, four chapters is sometimes called the little apocalypse. It's sort of like a miniature revelation tucked away in the middle of Isaiah. And then we're going to see the six woes against Jerusalem, and then the tribulation land. That all makes up what we're going to call the division number one. And then there's a sec. There's a little four chapter historical insertion we'll call division two. And, uh, and in fact, some of that in uh, Second Kings 18 was probably written by Isaiah himself, incidentally. But we're going to find about Hezekiah's trouble, his prayer, his illness, and then his folly. Very key part of history. And uh, Hezekiah will die and then Isaiah will be martyred. And we understand by traditions that he was sawed in half by a wooden saw, uh, by um, king, the succeeding king, Manasseh, with a wooden saw, believe it or not. But then that gets to the climax of the book, which we'll call Division 3. And uh, that's from 40 to 48. That'll give us the purpose of the peace that's coming. It'll focus on the Prince of Peace. And it wraps up with the program of peace, three, seg three segments of the third section. And we're going to discover that in this Prince of Peace is the chapter 53, which many scholars call the Holy of Holies of the Old Testament. And you'll discover something interesting, is that it's in the exact center of Division 3. It's, you, one of the things that's going to happen all along as we go, you're going to see evidence of uh, deliberate design in your entire Bible, not just in Isaiah. But as you see that, and as you get sensitive to that, it will change your perspective on the entire Bible to realize that every detail is there deliberately. Every detail there is by design. And, uh, and, and that's, of course, uh, one of the main things we're hoping you'll take away from these studies. And that'll be bracketed, too, by this phrase, there is no peace, saith the uh, to the wicked. And that's uh, both before and after those divisions. So we'll see, we'll be sensitive to the structure of that as we go. But tonight, last time we had an introduction, we tried to dismiss, I think we did successfully, this whole foolishness that's taught in many seminaries that there were two Isaiahs. And if you believe John, and, uh, he, he nails that for you uh, in John 12. We, uh, we, we, but we went through the, the whole, that whole issue last time. So if, you have any, if you're just joining us and you have any confusion on that, I encourage you to review our, first, our introductory session from the previous time. But we're going to jump right in this chapter 2 as we go here. And we're going to encounter a message for both Judah and Jerusalem. And uh, the verse, the chapter 2, verse 1, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And the ISV translates that pretty much straightforward, the message that Amos' son Isaiah received concerning Judah. There's, as we go, we'll take a look each time, verse by verse, how the ISV sees it. And more often than not, it won't be any surprise, it'll just be couched in a little more contemporary language. But we're not going to dismiss the King James, we're going to keep anchored to that, but we'll glean the benefit of the ISV, which in a couple of places will give us insights that have escaped other versions. So uh, verse 2, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And uh, now this is uh, uh, an interesting phrase because this appears almost verse by verse, uh, word by word, in uh, Micah. Uh, and, and, uh, and so many people are troubled by that. Um, careful study of both the Micah and the Isaiah passages has convinced most serious scholars that they both are quoting from a third source, by the way. But in any case, it really is academic because Isaiah is saying he is writing things that he personally saw or perceived. So that's really an academic issue, but you'll find the commentaries uh, spend some time on that. Come to pass in the last days at the mountain of the Lord's house. Mountains are used as an idiom or a metaphor of kingdoms or authority or rule. We see that in Daniel 2 and many other places. And so uh, uh, that is, that's the flavor of its use here. In Daniel 2 and Revelation 17, you find that the mountain is a, is a, is a, a metaphor 
of, uh, of authority, if you will. And here you notice also it says, all nations will flow unto it. So this is looking way ahead. This isn't a local uh, horizon here, that uh, all nations will flow unto it. And, uh, and as I say, verses 2 through 5 are very similar to Micah 4. There's three verses in, in uh, a few verses in uh, Micah that are, con- uh, he was contemporary with Isaiah, incidentally. He may, be in, may have been copying Isaiah for that matter. The ISV handles this pretty much the same way. It'll come about in the last days that the mountain that is the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of mountains and will be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. So it's a little more comfortable language maybe for us, but there's really no particular insights that we gain from that rendering, but let's, we'll move on here. But the idea of the last days, that's a phrase that comes up, and uh, uh, that is really uh, uh, speaking of the Messianic period. In some ways it's already started, but it often it be, the way it's being used, it really refers to the very end times when the Messiah establishes his kingdom on the earth. And uh, so it can be used denotatively or connotatively depending on the context. And so it's, uh, but it certainly carries, in any case, carries a reference to the Messianic age, and that's used all the way from Genesis on uh, throughout the scripture. Get to verse 3. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And uh, so this sort of has an echo. If you study the Gospel of John, you remember when Jesus encountered the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And one of the things she was troubled with, because the Samaritan had a slightly different view than the Jews have with some issues, and, and Jesus corrects that salvations of the Jews. And if you study that, we got into that uh, there, uh, because he resolved that uh, for us from the the Messiah himself. And so this is somewhat of that flavor. Now the uh, ISV handles it pretty straightforward. Many groups of people will come, come and come, let us go up to the temple of the God of Jacob, that they may teach us his ways, then let us walk in his paths. And uh, so then it breaks and goes into the instruction will proceed from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's a worldwide perspective. Now, most of us who have studied Ezekiel, you know the last nine chapters, there is a temple that's going to be built when Jesus sets up his kingdom. And the, the floor plan is quite detailed and it's all there. But one of the things that may surprise you is that the temple in the millennium will not be open on Sunday. And it's open on Shabbat and the new moons only. In, in Ezekiel 45. So the point is that um, uh, we want to be sensitive to that. There's, there's, there's probably far more that we're going to encounter uh, that doesn't usually come into our, our typical New Testament horizon. And so we want to be sensitive to that. And so, and he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. A very frequent quote you hear by people who love peace, and they allude to this because this is God's ultimate promise. There's going to be a lot of trouble between now and that being realized, understand that, but that is the goal, and that is a promise, and God, His restoration is always in view here. We're going to, we're going to see a lot about judgments all the way through the book, of, the, especially the, session, uh, the division one of uh, Isaiah, the first th- 35 chapters of the 66, but uh, you will see even there, there will always be uh, a, a reminder that His ultimate restoration is part of His commitment to us. So, and the ISV handles this pretty straightforward. He will judge between the nations and will render verdicts for the benefit of many. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not raise swords against nations and they will not learn war anymore. There's no real surprises in the uh, tra- translation that uh, pruning hooks and, uh, and plowshares being agricultural things. In other words, the, the technologies that we think of warfare will be adapted to a, a peaceful environment, obviously. Then he continues, O house of Jacob, come ye, let us walk in the light of the Lord. And that's pretty much the way the ISV renders it. You house of Jacob, come, let us live in the Lord's light, is the way they put it. But in any case, uh, verse 6, Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east, and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. Now this is, see, this, this is why there's a judgment coming. See, they've abandoned their own people by giving up the best things that the nation stood for. 
Now, as we stand there and start to look critically at that, let's be very careful because in America, they're doing the same thing. They're abandoning what they used to stand for, not realizing the implications of that. So there's a parallel here that we might uh, prayer, you know, uh, prayerfully go through. And in chat, from, from verse 6 to 22, we're going to have an emphasis on the necessity for humility in the day of the Lord. And uh, that is, uh, so the ISV handles this pretty straightforward. For you have rejected your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with practices learned from the east. And they are fortune tellers like the Philistines. They cut deals with foreigners. That's all sounds very straightforward, and yet that's, from God's point of view, a crime. Because they're favored. They had him, and they're rejecting him by turning, looking to the world for their solutions. And uh, they practice and learn from these. How interesting it is in a sophisticated uh, culture like we live in, so many people uh, reject the Word of God, but then they turn to Eastern religions of various kinds. And uh, it always amazes me when someone doesn't accept the Bible, I sort of can understand that, but then I'm always baffled what they do accept. Which is, anyway, let's just go on here. Uh, Verse 7, their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Recognize that in the Old Testament that was forbidden. They weren't to accumulate uh, those kinds of things. Solomon did, and he wasn't supposed to. And uh, so, see, where their treasures are, that's where their heart is. And that's in Mark 6 and Luke 12, you'll find that emphasis there. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And that's nothing wrong with silver and gold if you own it. But if it owns you, that's a whole other thing. That's a whole other thing. Well, ISV says their land is filled with silver and gold, and there is no end of their treasures. The land is filled with horses, and there's no end of the church. Okay, their land is also full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. And the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself. Therefore, forgive them not. See, God's offended by that. God is offended by that. The ISV says their land is filled with idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their own fingers have made. So mankind is humbled. Each human being is brought low, and you won't forgive, is the way they're rendering the text there. Verse 10, enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. And uh, the, f- the fear of the Lord, you know, that's a phrase that gets mangled in ma- from many pulpits. There are 18 words in the Hebrew that get translated fear, for fear of the Lord. And virtually all of them involve trembling. It isn't just a reverential awe. Many people say, well, that just means a reverential awe. And I can understand what they're trying to say on the one hand, and yet, and yet, we need to not lose the perspective that it's God we're talking about. It's God that we're talking about. And uh, so, but we'll move on here. The ISV says, spot the same thing, go into the rocks, hide in the dust to escape the terror of the Lord and to escape the glory of His majesty. Notice that they do use the word terror. That's appropriate. You don't find that in, you know, Sunday school materials very often, but the terror of the Lord, to escape, and to escape the glory of His majesty. Wow, okay. Verse 11, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. So it's a call to humility. Now they're focusing on men here. You girls uh, don't get too comfortable. He's going to take after the girls here a little bit before the evening's over. So, uh, but anyway, at this point we're t- you're speaking of man, and you can probably look at this as Mr. and Mrs. Man, if you will. Mankind is the, is the idiom here. And, uh, but the looks of man shall be humbled. And you can compare this with Isaiah 14, where there was an angel that didn't do that. An angel that allowed himself to be worshipped, and he got into a lot of trouble. His name was Lucifer, and we'll get to that when we get to chapter 14. But uh, ISV says here, the haughty looks of mankind shall be brought low. The lofty pride of human beings shall be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. And that's one of the things we need to be careful, that if there's something good, make sure you give give the Lord the credit. It's very easy of us to get carried away sometimes and fail to do that. And we need to watch that closely. Well, verses 12 to 14, uh, for the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. 
and upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up. So one of the things we'll get sensitive to, even in the translation, we'll get a sense that Isaiah is incredibly eloquent. He expresses these things with uh, high language all the way through. And uh, the ISV treats this pretty straightforward. For the Lord of the heavenly armies, when you say Lord of hosts, that's the King James style, but the Lord of the heavenly armies is the translation the ISV uses, has reserved a day to oppose all who are proud and haughty, and to oppose the self-exalting, they will be humbled. He will take a stand against the cedars of Lebanon, and against the proud and self-exalting, and against the oaks of Bashan, against all the high mountains, and against all the lofty hills. Those trees and so forth were metaphors for greatness. The cedars of Lebanon meant more just the trees. It was a, an idiom of, of uh, exultation in a broader sense. But uh, continuing in verse 15, And upon every high tower, and upon every fenced wall, upon all the ships of Tarshish, upon all the pleasant pictures, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord shall alone shall be exalted in that day. So this is pretty much an echo of the previous, except there's a couple of things in here. You'll quickly discover that most people don't know much about the ships of Tarshish, but if you research, you research that, you'll discover what they're talking about are ocean-going vessels that were equipped to go for cruises of two or three years. They were global trotters. There's much evidence of trade between the Eastern Mediterranean and the British Isles, strangely enough. In fact, uh, the, Tarsh the Tarshish was known as a source of tin, and the name Britannia means a source of tin. So uh, uh, many people say, well, Tarshish was really a place in Spain. No, it may have been, but the, 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 the ships were equipped to go for two years at a time, two or three years. And so as you start studying that, we, it's, it's, a, it's an idiom, chips of Tarshish, it's an idiom of the furthest commercial reach in those days. Uh, you know, we sometimes use the expression taking a slow boat to China as a, as a, f a figure of speech. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's what Jonah was trying to do when he boarded a ship to Tarshish rather than go to Nineveh. That was as far away as he could think. And of course, you know the story there. God explained it to him a little more clearly. But uh, the ISV handles against every high tower, against every fortified wall, against all the ships of Tarshish, and against all their impressive watercraft. Humanity's haughtiness will be humbled, male arrogance will be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. And so that's the, uh, <laughs> that's the perspective from the ISV. And the idols he shall utterly abolish, and, he sh and they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord, and for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. In other words, when these judgments start, the kings are going to hide in caves. Now that phrase should uh, stick in your ears if you remember two things. If you remember in Joshua, when they're going, when they're in the conquest of the land, the kings that resisted them hid in the rocks and caves. And when you get to the book of Revelation, and things get rough, the kings of the earth hide in caves, say, rocks fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. It's interesting that those phrases, I believe, link together. And uh, so, uh, in the ISV they say, Their idols will utterly vanish, they will enter caverns in the rocks and holes in the ground to escape the presence of the terror of the Lord, to escape the splendor of His majesty when He arises to terrify the earth. And so, it's, uh, when, when this, I, I want to just pause on the verse uh, 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 19 here. They shall go in the holes of the rocks and in the caves of the earth. Because one of the things I invite you to do is study and discover, if you haven't yet, the parallel between the book of Joshua and the book of Revelation. And uh, uh, it's, it, uh, the, 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 uh, it, it's, it's, it's very provocative. Let me just give you a quick summary. The uh, Yehoshua, the name of the book of Joshua is the name of Jesus in, in Hebrew. Yehoshua is the name of the book. And that's the title of Jesus in the, he in the Hebrew, Yeshua or Yehoshua. And, uh, we see Joshua there portrayed, uh, he, he's, he's uh, taken under the wing of a military commander, and that's none other than Jesus Christ. If you look carefully at the last, uh, the last verses of uh, Joshua 5, a military, uh, a, and he, what he's doing is dispossessing the usurpers. There is a seven-year campaign. That should ring familiar. And uh, against seven, they're going to fighting against seven an of an original ten nations. Many people miss that. 
Three were already put down under Moses, but there's seven left, and that's what Joshua is engaging against seven nations. And that's exactly what we see in Daniel portraying the Armageddon and all of that. Uh, the Torah is ignored at Jericho. All these laws in the Torah are ignored. Because the Ark of the Covenant was not supposed to go to war. It leads the parade. And, and uh, uh, they're supposed to observe Shabbat. No, they march around once a day, keeping silence. Everybody misses that. And then on the seventh day, they go around seven times. At the end of that, they shout, walls come down, you know the story. And you study the book of Revelation, they have the seven-sealed book. And then you have the seven trumpets. And chapter 8, verse 1, and then there was, uh, there was silence in heaven for half an hour. Strange phrase there. You begin to realize it's almost the Holy Spirit patterning the drama of Revelation. It fits the model of Joshua, strange enough. In fact, it goes on. Joshua first sends in two witnesses, these two guys that stay with Rahab, and uh, they weren't getting intelligence. They were there to, well, I guess they did that too, but they were there to get Rahab saved because Rahab is in the Messianic family tree. Okay, she was the mother of Boaz, who you get in, in the book of Ruth and so on. There are seven trumpet events in Joshua, and there's seven trumpet events, obviously, in, in Joshua. And it's preceded in silence by heaven, in, uh, heaven for half an hour. It's in Revelation 8, verse 1. And then uh, the enemies that Joshua is facing confederate uh, under a leader um, in, in Jerusalem who calls himself Adonai Zedek, the Lord of Righteousness. He's a false Lord of Righteousness. Does that sound familiar with the... Okay, and so uh, they're ultimately defeated in the Battle of Bethharn by hailstones and fire from heaven, which is exactly what happens in uh, the book of Revelation. The, one of the climactic judgments are hailstones that weigh a hundred pounds each. And why? Because stoning was always the penalty for idolatry, for, for uh, you know, idolatry, uh, blasphemy, I should say. There were signs in the sun and the moon in Joshua and in Revelation. And so the cave, and then finally the kings hide in caves. Rocks fall on us, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. And I think that's it, climactic in Joshua 10, but it's also climactic in Revelation 6. That's why when I see it in Isaiah, that phrase rings in my ear. I, must, I don't want to overplay that, but in my mind, at least conceptually, those three things are linked together. But let's move on here in verse 20. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which were made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats. <laughs> I love that. And uh, so the uh, Masoretic text and the, uh, the other texts agree with the, the uh, ISV here. At that time mankind will throw their silver and gold idols that their fingers have made as objects of worship to the moles and to the bats. So no surprise there. We'll go on. And to, uh, into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for the fear of the Lord, for the glory of His majesty when He riseth to shake terribly the earth. Man, can, can, can you imagine what it's going to be like when God gets angry? You know, we so focus on his, his grace and His mercy indeed. But at the same time, we should not ignore the fact that He, there are things that get Him angry. And we need to be sensitive to that. And uh, cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? Interesting phrase, by the way. Throughout the scripture, you'll notice when you speak of man's breath, it's used as a metaphor of his frailty. So you and I can't, uh, should be grateful for each new breath that comes. Because when that stops, you stop. The breath, in, the breath of man is, is used almost as a metaphor of his frailty. In, not just here, but in the scripture. Cease ye for man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? And that's, uh, the ISV says pretty much the same thing. They will enter caverns of the rocks and clefts in the cliffs to escape the terror of the Lord and to escape the splendor of His majesty when He arises to terrorize the earth. Stop trusting in human beings whose life breath is in their nostrils for what are they really worth is the flavor. Uh, the the uh, ISV probably picks it up a little clearer maybe than the King James does. Well, we're now going to move to the next chapter. We're talking about n the national disintegration through sin. The problem is the nation is collapsing because of sin. And does that sound familiar? Is that, true of the, is that true of Europe today? Is that true of America today? In, in ways that in general, certainly in America, they don't perceive. 
They run around and say, we've got some problems, but it'll work out somehow. They have no grasp of how serious the problems are. And, uh, but uh, in any case, we're gonna, this is all going to be detailed more in the next session, next week when we get to chapter 5. We're gonna, uh, it'll be detailed even more. But let's go on here. In chapter 3, verse 1. For behold, the Lord and the Lord of hosts doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread, the whole stay of water. And I, I assume I make that a little clear. Note this, the Lord God of the heavenly armies is taking away from Jerusalem and Judah everything that your society needs, all food supplies and all water supplies. Now this is one of those places the ISV probably is a little more focused for us. The mighty man, the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the prudent and the ancient, the captain of the fifty and the honorable man and the counselor and the cunning artificer and the eloquent orator. See, what it's really talking about is depriving the city of its qualified leadership was the course that, uh, 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 that we're, they're on. And uh, uh, in, in fact, what they end up doing is resorting to Nebuchadnezzar, strangely enough, and he's going to put, he's going to take him in captivity. That's looking ahead, of course. Here, the, the ISV renders this, the, the mighty man and the warrior, the judge, the prophet, the fortune teller, and the elder, the commander of the 50, the commander of, and the man of rank, the counselor, the expert magician, and the medium. And uh, so, I will give children to be their princes and babes shall rule over them." That's a strange kind of a curse, isn't it? Sort of. See, what he's saying, the inferior persons will take over the affairs. Babes ruling over them is, is a form of curse, strangely. See, and, and, and this is a very pregnant verse. You see, one of the things that I think they've, they've learned in England is that eliminating parental control over children raises a rebellious and uncontrollable generation. So you want to, this idea of no spank loss and so forth, many people don't realize the long-term implications of that in terms of the kind of generation you will raise up. And that's what, that's the problem they have in the UK today and the seeds are in that kind of legislation of the past. Something to think about. And that's why it's perhaps a blessing to be in a smaller nation where things are changeable. Trying to change things in the UK or in the United States is, a, is pretty rough in a, in a in a small country like we live in here in New Zealand, they at least have the, New Zealand's the size of Israel. Small, everybody knows everybody. It's a small community. There's a chance of it responding to the needs of the people. And uh, anyway, the ISV trend says, I will make boys their princes and infants shall rule over them. And that's intended to be a, uh, uh, it's, a uh, it's a great calamity uh, when those who are, in, are ruling are inexperienced. Inexperienced leaders can create havoc and lead to anarchy, actually. And so we'll go on here. And all the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable. See, there's an inversion going on, isn't there? Most mature cultures re render the ancient, the older ones, for advice. It's when that starts getting turned upside down, it leads to chaos and anarchy. Anarchy follows as a consequence from poor government. And that's what's been predicted in the preceding verses here. The ISV says, people will oppress one another. It will be man against man and neighbor against neighbor. The young will be disrespectful of the old and the worthless to the honorable. And uh, see, that's one of the great tragedies in America. They have disconnected character and destiny. The belief structure that made the country great for two centuries was the idea that if you had high character, you had a better chance of progressing. It was, they, they linked the concept of character to be succeeding. We've disconnected that. And we have, uh, instead of that kind of achievement-oriented culture, we have, a, it's, a, it's wheeling and dealing and, and uh, getting what you don't deserve kind of men mentality. When a man shall take hold of his brother of the house of his father and saying, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thy hand. Well, that's a little confusing. What does ISV say? For a man shall grab his brother in his own father's house and say, You have a cloak, so you be our leader, and this heap of ruins will be under your rule. <laughs> in that day he shall, he shall swear, saying, I will not be an, a healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. And so uh, the ISV renders the, that verse, uh, uh, but at that time he'll protest. He'll say, I won't be your healer. Uh, I will be neither food nor clothing in my house. You're not going to make me a leader of the people. <laughs> For Jerusalem is ruined, verse 8, 
and Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord, to provoke the eyes of His glory. And the ISV picks that up, for Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen, because what they say and do opposes the Lord. They keep defying Him. That's the root problem. And uh, the show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. The ISV picks that up pretty well. The expressions on their faces give them away. They parade their sin around like Sodom. They don't even try to hide it. How horrible it will be for them, because they have brought disaster on themselves. And this is going to be dramatized here uh, in, in uh, chapter 5 before we're through here. Say to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Or in the ISV uh, style, it says, they tell the righteous the things that go well, because they will enjoy the fruit of their actions. In, uh, in, uh, in verse 11, Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. For, as for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy paths. And uh, we're going to see these woes dramatized when we get to chapter 5, and it's six classic woes, and we'll get there. But basically what it's suggesting here, in the absence of good masculine leadership, tyrannical women have taken over. And let's see where he goes with this one. So it's a warning to the wicked. It says, how terrible it be for the wicked. The disaster is headed their way because what, they, because what they did with their hand will be repaid to them. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. My people, your leaders are misleading you. They're giving you confusing directions. And it goes on, Then the Lord standeth up to plead, and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people, and the princes thereof. For ye have eaten up the vineyard, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. And the ISV rendering of the same thing is, the Lord is taking his place to argue this case. He is standing up to judge the peoples. The Lord will go to court to oppose the elders and the princes of people. You're the ones who have been devouring the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your own houses. And so uh, it, on it goes. And then Isaiah continues, What mean ye that ye beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts? And I, I see, so how dare you crush my people as you grind down the face of the poor, declares the Lord God of the heavenly armies. Pretty straightforward stuff so far. In verse 16, more of the Lord says, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and make a tinkling with their feet. <laughs> And to put it in the ISV, the Lord also says, Because Zion's women are so haughty and walk with outstretched necks, flirting with their eyes and prancing along as they walk, and making tinkling noises with their ankle bracelets. And I won't ask if any of you have any of those things. We'll keep moving here. <laughs> Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. Wow. See, in other words, what Isaiah is saying is the Lord will bring upon them the very opposite of what they desire to display, is what he's really saying here. And the ISV catches up pretty well. Therefore, the Lord will afflict the sores of the heads of Zion's women, and the Lord will expose their private parts. That's, uh, that's what it says, okay? Going on to verse 18. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet, and their calls, and their round tires like the moon. I'm going to come back to that phrase here in a minute. The chains and bracelets are, and the mufflers, the bonnets, the ornaments of the legs, and the headbands, and the tablets, and the earrings, the rings, and the nose jewels, and it goes on with some of these. But before we go on, there's a list of these things. Before we go on, I want you to notice the round tires like the moon. Now that's in the King James translation. What's it really talking about, incidentally? The word in the Hebrew is saharon which is a moon or a crescent moon. So they're, 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 that same thing is translated in Judges 8 as simply ornaments, but it's the same word. These are crescent moons in Judges 8. These are crescent moons in Isaiah 3. Now today, that strikes us as a glimpse of something deeper. 
What kind of emblems are they wearing? Muslim. Muslim is the worship of the moon god. It was then, and it still is. And I don't want to get into a whole diversion here, but you might make in your notes to check it out, and you'll discover Islam did not begin with Muhammad. He just codified it in a slightly different form. The widespread war, uh, worship in Arabia was al Ilah, the moon god. And it is still to this day. And uh, so I encourage you to make a note of that and do your own homework. Well, let's take a look at what the ISV does with this here. At, the t at that time, the Lord will take away the finery of the ankle bracelets, the headbands, and the crescents. They do pick that up. The pendants, the bracelets, the veils, the headdresses, the armlets, the sashes, the perfume boxes, the charms, and the signet rings and nose rings. Okay, but it gets crescents, so the ISV picks up on that. The changeable suits of apparel, the mantles, the wimples, the crisping pins, the glasses, the fine linen, the hoods, and the veils. And the ISV calls it the fine robes, capes, purses, mirrors, linen garments, uh, tiaras, and uh, veils. Okay, st pretty straightforward. And it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be a stink. Instead of a girdle, a rent. Instead of well-set hair, baldness. And instead of a stomacher of girding sackcloth, a, and burning instead of beauty. This <laughs> In other words, branding instead of beauty is what you could summarize it. Frivolous women breed a sensual and frivolous nation is the flavor here. And so, ISV says, And it shall come about that instead of fragrance there will be a stench, instead of a belt, a rope, instead of well-set hair, baldness, instead of a fine robe, sackcloth, instead of beauty, shame. So the ISV picks up the, the flow, perhaps a little more crisper as we would re relate to that. Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty in the war. And her gates shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. And I, I, your men will die violently, and your forces fall in battle, and your gates lament and mourn. Ravage she will sit on the ground. So that gets us a very little, short little chapter called chapter 4. The vision of the coming kingdom. And this is very parallel to the 11th chapter of Isaiah that we'll come to later. But anyway, <clears throat> very strange verse in chapter 4, verse 1, which is probably uh, picking up the tone of the previous chapter. And in that day, seven women will take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Strangely, this verse was, has been used to me by some of the Messianic fellowships, because when you go to a Messianic fellowship, especially in the United States, you'll discover that, it's, that uh, seven out of ten of the attendees are Gentiles. And they often point to this as a thing, which is a misapplication in my mind of that. But moving on, the ISV simply says, at that time seven women will cling tightly to one man, and they will make him this offer. We'll provide our own bread, we'll provide our own clothes, just let us marry you so we won't be stigmatized anymore, is the flavor of that, presumably. And then verse 2, In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. And this is where it really shifts gears here. And the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And uh, so, the branch. Here is a term that you want to pick up in the Bible that's used frequently. When it speaks of the branch, what is it talking about? One of, the brand, one of those words is Netzer, which is a synonym for Nazarene. But uh, there's, uh, the, the, the word here happens to be Tzemek. That's one of 20 words that can need branch. But it's a word that always refers to the Messiah. And we're going to study that strangely when we get to chapter 7 in, in, uh, in uh, Isaiah for some surprises that will come out of that. It technically means uh, sprout or growth. Uh, the ISV says, at that time the Lord's branch will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and glory of the survivors of Israel and Judah. But this word tzemek, which means sprout, growth, and so forth, leads to a study of the branch. There's at least four ways that we see him called the branch. The branch of the Lord, that speaks of the Emmanuel character of Christ, as will be rep reflected in Isaiah 7, verse 4, when we get there. To be fully manifested in his return of glory is the flavor of that particular expression. There's all, he's also known as the branch of David, that he's the Messiah. In other words, it's the messianic line, if you will, of the seed of David according to the flesh, we find in Romans chapter 1, that was revealed in earthly glory as the king of kings, the flavor there. There's a third use of the Lord's servant, the, the servant, the branch, in Zechariah 3, verse 8, which refers to his humiliation and his obedience unto death 
which will be picked up in Isaiah 52 and following, and also Philippians, the kenosis in Philippians 2 is the famous uh, summary of all of that. And there's a fourth thing, the man whose name is the branch, which is in Zechariah 6, and that speaks of him as the last Adam. Adam lost the dominion, this is the second man, or the last Adam, to regain it. Reigning as priest king over the dominion given and lost uh, by the first Adam. That's why in Revelation chapter 5, when the seventh seal book, it had to be a man to inherit. It had to be a kinsman of Adam. Not just a super angel. No, no. It had to be a kinsman of Adam. And John sobs convulsively until the elder says, wait, 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 wait. Look, the line of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open the book. And, and that thing goes on. Because he uh, uh, became a man to earn, to be, to be worthy and to regain that dominion for us. And so... Now these four perspectives, by the way, here, of the branch, align with the perspectives of each of the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, respectively. So I'll let you play with that as you look at this. We'll go on. The word Semek, by the way, is the title of the Messiah all through the Scripture. And it's a key element in the, in the constellation of Virgo. And that may surprise you. The, vir, the constellation of the Virgin, she's holding a Semek. So that's a clue that there's what's coming when you get to Isaiah 7. There's some surprises there. And your, your springboard for that is Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows His handiwork. That's not just creation. It's also His redemption, amazingly enough. That's why there's 12 constellations that reflect the 12 tribes of Israel. We'll get into that later. Verse 3. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy. And every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. Now, these are the survivors. This is the remnant. Okay, and uh, so the, uh, the the concept of a book enters in. Every one that is written. We have subtly here the concept of the, a book. That's interesting. That uh, that shows up in Exodus 32, Psalm 69, and elsewhere. I as he says, whosoever survives in Zion and whosoever remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who has been appointed to survive. In other words, this this is what we sometimes call the remnant. And the remnant only escape after severe trials. Verse 4, When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment, and by the spirit of burning. Ooh. Now, as V says, When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the women of Zion, cleaning up Jerusalem's guilt by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of tempest. Okay, fair enough. It's pretty straightforward. Verse 5, And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of the Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and a smoke by day and a shining of a flaming fire by night. For upon all the glory shall be a defense. And that, of course, echoes the experience of the wilderness wanderings. Cloud by day and a fire by night and so forth. There's a deliberate tie-in, if you will, back to Exodus 13 and so on. Okay. The ISV says the Lord will create over the entire side of Mount Zion, including over those who assemble there, a cloud by day accompanied by smoke, as well as the brilliance of flaming fire by night. And there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat, and for a place of refuge, and for a covert from storm and from rain. And the way the ISV puts it, this also to serve as a refuge or shelter from the storms and the rain. Well, we're at chapter, that's a short little chapter. Now we're at chapter 5, and we'll wrap it up for tonight. Uh, it's, we're going to encounter in chapter 5, the first few verses are about the Lord's vineyard. And uh, the first seven verses deal with this. And it'll sound familiar to you because it's drawn upon so often in the Gospels. But let's go to Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1. And now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. That sounds wonderful, doesn't it? As he says, I will sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. The one I love had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. Starts off great, doesn't it? Okay. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with a choice of vine, built a tower in the midst of it, also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes. That's the expectation. Very positive. Did everything you could expect. But here's the bad news. It brought forth wild grapes. And that may not ring to you, but that's what it brings forth grapes that are not suitable for winemaking. Okay? They're bad grapes. They're, bad, they're sour grapes. 
The word wild actually mean, can mean stinking or sour bad grapes is the flavor. You've got to pick up on that. Without that insight from the King James, you might miss the point that's going on here. The ISV picks up on this. He plowed his land and cleared it of stones. Then he planted it with the choices of mines, built a watchtower in the middle of it, dug a vine vat in it. He expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only wild ones or sour ones. So verse 3, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. He's going to say, gee, is there anything else I could have done? See? Uh, a lesson from Isaiah's song here in ISV says, So now, you inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, won't you please, between me and my vineyard. It picks up the tone of it here. Verse 4, What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, that it brought forth only wild grapes, the sinking sour grapes. And the ISV says the same thing. What more could I do to my vineyard that I haven't already done when I expected to produce good grapes? Why did it yield wild ones? And now go to. I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up. And I'll break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. ISV says pretty much the same thing. Now let me tell you, won't you please, what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I'm going to take away its protective hedge. It will be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. And I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned nor digged. And there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no more upon it. Ooh, ooh. The ISV, I will make it a wasteland, and it will not be pruned or cultivated. Instead, briars and thorns will grow up, and I will also issue commands to the clouds that they drop no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. See, this is obviously a metaphor being explained to you here. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold oppression. For righteousness... But behold, a cry. Boy. And uh, now, there's intense paranomasia here. Now, uh, pun, there's puns going on. In the Hebrew, there are words that sound, these words are sound, they sound similar, but they're very different. They have misbat for justice, and you got mispach for bloodshed. They have tzedakah for righteousness, but tzedakah is cry. In other words, the, the words in the Hebrew are very sim they sound very similar, but they're very different. So there's word play going on here. We miss, of course, because, it's the, because of the, the translation. The ISV says, For the vineyard of the Lord of heavenly armies is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden in which he delights. He looked for justice, but saw only bloodshed. He searched for righteousness, but heard only an outcry. And what you don't pick up is though those are actually near puns in, 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 in the, uh, in the uh, Hebrew. And so, so the, uh, the echoes of this parable that we've just read is in Matthew 21, Mark 12, and Luke 20. A very similar discussion, and in those discussions, you can, when you stu study those or teach those, you want to tie it back to the first seven verses of Isaiah 5, because they, they link together. But now we get to six woes. By the way, there's actually seven. But I don't want to confuse you, because everybody in Bible land knows about six woes of Isaiah. So let's not, but uh, there's one place where there's a se seventh one implied. So technically there's seven, but let's not confuse people. Let's go on here. Uh, the first one is about materialism, verses 8, 9, and 10. Then hedonism, 11 to 17. Flaunting sin is the third one. The denial of the Word of God is the fourth one. And that really echoes the church of Laodicea in Revelation 3, verse 14 to the end. And... Uh, the fifth one is relativism, and the, the last one is the lack of justice, but that actually could be split into two by the way the wording is. So, But there's actually six woes declared, and that's, everybody knows that, so let's not confuse ourselves. Let's just go on with this. The verse one is in verse 8. Woe unto them that join house to house and lay field to field, till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. So this is a, a expression of land barons, or a form of, 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 of acquisition. In other words, how terrible it would be for you to join house to house and add field to field until there is no more room and you have settled yourselves alone in the middle of the land. And so, in mine ears, said the Lord of hosts, of a truth many houses shall be desolate and even great and fair without inhabitant. So that's going to echo back on them. That, that, that greed, that materialism is going, to, is going to bankrupt them, in other words. 
Uh, ISV says, the Lord of the heavenly armies has declared this so I could, I could hear it. Surely many houses will become desolate, great and beautiful houses without occupants. Does that sound like the financial break in 2008? It's echoing throughout the world. Very similar, I'm not, I don't want to overplay it, but it's interesting. Some of this concern is on our own horizon here. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of an omer shall yield an ephah. A ten, an acre, by the way, is originally defined as uh, the amount that a yoke of oxen could, pl could uh, uh, plow in a day. So ten acres would be ten days, ten days worth. But it's, it's, it's going to, what this is saying, it's going to yield ten percent of expectation. That's really what it's saying here. A yield of a tenth of what would be expected is being expressed here, in effect. And that's what the ISV says, that for ten acres of vineyard will produce only six gallons, and ten bushels of seed shall produce only one bushel. So you get the flavor of it anyway. N next of all, woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. So we've got alcoholism here, don't we? How terrible, the ISV, how terrible be for those who rise up at dawn in order to grab a stiff drink for those who stay up late at night as wine inflames them. I won't ask for a show of hands if you know anybody like that. We'll move on. And the harp and the vial and the tabret and the pipe and wine are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of His hands. So it's like what, uh, what some people would lay a zither, a harp, tambourine, and flute are listed here. But babe, uh, uh, ignorance, by the way, can be damnably culpable. Say, so ignorance is bliss. No, it isn't. Ignorance is dangerous. Uh, Isaiah says, they have the lyre and the harp, the tambourine and the flute, as well as wine at their feast. But they don't respect what the Lord is doing, nor do they consider His actions. So, therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. So, on it goes. Therefore my people go into exile because they lack understanding. My honored men go hungry, and the crowd is parched with thirst. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoices shall descend into it. The ISV renders this a little differently. He says, Therefore Sheol's appetite has grown, it has opened its mouth beyond limit, Jerusalem's nobility and her multitudes go, will go there, along with her brawlers and whosoever is reveling within her. Well, yeah, and a Sheol, it's not a grave. Grave is something you can own, it's the physical. Sheol is the where the departed spirits go in the Old Testament economy. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. ISV said, picks that up. Humanity is brought low, and each one is humbled, while the eyes of the self-exalting are brought low. But verse 16, the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. But the ISV says, but the Lord of the heavenly armies is exalted in justice, and the holy God proves himself to be righteously holy. Then shall the lambs feed after their manner, and the waste places of the fat ones shall strangers eat. In other words, lambs will graze in their pasture, fatlings and foreigners will eat among the waste places of the rich. This is the one that really grabs me. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin, as it were, with a cart rope. They're not only sinning, they're parading it with pride. You've seen on television, you've seen the so-called gay pride parades. This is, the, the, this is described here. It's total self-deception. A judgment of God for those who fail to acknowledge Him as Creator. Let me give you a little clue. I, I taught Romans chapter 1, the last half there, from verse 18 to the end of that chapter, as a, a verse, a, as a passage on homosexuality for years. I never realized what it really was. It's actually not about homosexuality as an individual sin. There's plenty of other places that deals with that. No, what's going on there in Romans 1 is God is declaring a judgment on those cultures that fail to acknowledge Him as a Creator. In that passage, three times He says, because they have not acknowledged me as Creator, I will give them over to that which is incon not convenient. Homo as a cultural thing, homosexuality is a judgment of God on a culture that fails to acknowledge Him as a Creator. And that stunned me to realize that's what it's really about. Check it out yourself. Come to your own conclusions on that. 
the ISV says, how terrible it will be for those who prayed iniquity with cords of falsehood and who draw sin along as with a cart rope. Yeah. Okay, but uh, verse 19, that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it, and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. This is a taunt by these people drawing their sin, parading it in a, a, a float, in a parade or whatever. That say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. Let the counsel of the Holy One draw nigh and come that we may know it. See, that's a taunt. That's not, a, that's not an honoring thing. It's a taunt. And the ISV picks up, who say, they say, quote, let God be quick, let him speed up his work so we may see it. Let it happen. Let the plan of the Holy One of Israel draw near so that we may recognize it. See, that's a dare. That's a taunt, if you will. Well, go, Isaiah goes on, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And boy, is, does that describe the world we live in today. It used to be in the old days, you, you, you went to school because you want to learn right from wrong. Today in school you learn there is no right and wrong. You have your, you have your truth, I have mine. You know, we've destroyed uh, by, with this relativism. Well, that's what the ISV picks up. In fact, they call this the judgment of the moral relativists. How terrible it will be for those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute what is bitter for what is sweet and what is sweet for what is bitter. And it goes, they, the, as it goes on, woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. How terrible it will be for those who are wise in their own opinion and clever in their own understanding. In the book of Judges, when things are really, really down, it's, the, it's, 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 it's as bad as they can get, the phrase that reoccurs is, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That sounds right, but it isn't. That, that, that's, it, that, that's how bad it got. Everybody set their own standards, so to speak. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men to, of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward, and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. And so, uh, and by the way, there is a, it's, there, the sentence structure in the Hebrew would make it permissible to supply an implied woe but, uh, before verse 23. And, th and th the original sentence structure and the original laws for that, and it would, that would make the total list of woes seven rather than six, by the way, which is comfortable from a heptatic point of view, but if we insist on that, we'll confuse a lot of people. I just put it as a footnote and we go on. But anyway, the corrupt judges are under consideration here. They allow themselves to be bribed, a sin most strongly condemned under Mosaic law, in Exodus 23 and Deuteronomy 16. And well, as he picks up on this, how terrible it will be for those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing strong drink, who acquit the guilty for a bribe and deprive the innocent of justice. Says it right, right very straightforward. Verse 24, therefore is the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. So all these six, or call it seven if you want, woes are regarded as combustible material ready for the fire of judgment. And that's an interesting metaphor to use, because it's exactly what Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 3. And uh, when, when works are, are, are evaluated. And so, uh, but you notice in Hebrew here, they say that it speaks of the root of rottenness and the, as a blossom. That's a Hebrew way. See, they're talking about the root and the blossom, the, the whole plant. That's their way of saying it's totally corrupt from the roots to the blossom. See, it's, it's, a, it's a form of eloquence you may miss what he's really trying to say here. And uh, so it's a rhetorical device to connote the extremes of rottenness in the entirety. That's what's going on here. Well, the ISV picks this up, and therefore, as the flames of fire devour straw, as dry grass collapses in, fr in flames, so their root will be rotten, their blossom will blow away like dust, because they have rejected the instruction of the Lord of the heavenly armies, and have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Whew, okay. Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he hath stretched forth his hand against them, hath smitten them, and the hills did tremble, and their carcasses uh, carcasses were uh, torn in the midst of the streets. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And uh, so, I might point out, see, this was, some of this is unique to Israel, not any nation. But they alone had the word of the Lord. Other nations didn't. They did. Nations outside of Israel didn't have that. See, more was expected of Israel is God's point. That's the issue here. And there is a sense in which some of that, that, that kind of logic can be used against America, too. 
Let's look at ISV here. It says, Therefore the anger of the Lord is burned against his people, so he stretched out his hands against them and afflicted them. The mountains quaked, and their corpses were like refuge in the middle of the streets. Throughout all of this, his anger was not turned away. His hands are still stretched out to attack. And he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far, and he will hiss them from the end of the earth. And behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. That is, their enemies will. And Assyria is on the horizon, that, as Isaiah is talking here, for the northern kingdom. That's going to be a major feature as we go forward. But the, later, Babylon will be on the horizon for the southern kingdom, in a similar way. Not the same way, similar way. In the final analysis, in Revelation, it's mystery Babylon. It's a, youth, it's a metaphor for the enemies of God in whatever form they are then. And uh, so it's Assyrian Babylon and Mystery Babylon as three levels of, of uh, perception here. Well, as V says, the Lord will signal the nations far away, whistling for them to come from the ends of the earth. Look how quickly and how swiftly they come. And this can be applied in a sense, uh, at least metaphorically at least, to Armageddon. None shall be weary or stumble among them, none shall slumber nor sleep, neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes broken. And he's, no one is weary, no one stumbles, no one slumbers. He's talking about the enemies coming, see? No belt around their waists will be undone, nor will their sandal straps be broken. Whose arrows are sharp, and their bows bent, and their horses' hoofs shall be counted like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind. Do you feel the eloquence of, of uh, uh, Isaiah coming through? Their arrows are sharp, their bows are ready for action, their, hoo their horses' hooves seem like flint, and their chariot wheels spin like whirlwind. You can just visualize it, can't you? Their roaring shall be like a lion, and they shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar, and they shall lay hold of the prey, and they shall carry it away safe, and none shall deliver it. Well, they, uh, I see, they will roar like a lion, they shall snarl like young lions. They growl, they graze, they seize their prey, and then carry it off with no one to rescue, is what the flavor of it is there. And uh, now this is, a diff this is a difficult verse to translate, by the way. It's, uh, it, uh, and in that day there shall be a roar against them like the roaring of the sea, and one and if one look unto the land, behold darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. And this is hard to translate, but it's obviously gloominess everywhere. The ISV says they will roar over it at that time like the sea waves roar. If one surveys the land, watch out, there's darkness and distress. Even the daylight is darkened by its clouds. That's their way they deal with the difficult. I want you for next session, read, study carefully, chapters 6 and 7. We won't take two next time. Uh, plenty of time to really get at some topics. We're going to visit the throne room of the universe next time. And that'll be exciting. And uh, we're also going to explore this virgin birth. No surprise, but there's aspects to it that may come as a big surprise. So that'll be fun. And we're also going to show you, if, you're a, if you are a professional cryptographer and taking a formal course in cryptography, then you know that there are some encryptions in the Bible. I'm not talking about the equidistant letter sequence things. And, but there, one of these occur in Isaiah 7, and that encryption will reveal a plot that was behind the scenes. Not a big deal, but I think you'll find it interesting to recognize that there are hidden messages in the Scripture, not the ones people publish books on, typically. This is something different. So we'll take a quick look, a quick look at that next time. So let's close with a word of prayer.